inside story on the issues that affect you and your community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. I'm Dan Hurley. Since the election of Donald Trump and the ascendancy of the alt-right leader Stephen Bannon as the president's chief strategist, the nation has experienced an alarming outbreak of ugly expressions of hate directed at minorities. Some of the targeted groups, Jews, African Americans, and immigrants, have long been in the crosshairs. Others, especially Muslims, are relatively new targets. The reaction to the swastikas and other expressions of hate uh, spray painted on the sign at Hebrew Union College and on grounds at Withrow High School in the middle of the night was swift. Both incidents brought dozens of people out to send a message to the faculty and students studying at HUC in Withrow that many Cincinnatians value their presence and contributions to the community and want to stand in the light of day in solidarity with them. Last Saturday, a different sort of demonstration of solidarity took place at the Greater Cincinnati Islamic Center in Westchester. Over 600 non-Muslims responded to an invitation to an open house from the Muslim community centered in Butler County. Those in attendance not only learned of some basic information about Islam, but also observed afternoon prayer and most importantly interacted with Cincinnati Muslims as neighbors. As hate incidents have occurred locally and nationally in the last several months, I have been struck by the rapid reaction of others to stand up against those actions. At the same time, I've been challenged to imagine proactive ways that a local community like ours can take action to reach across what seems like a growing and ugly national divide. To talk about that, I am joined this morning by two people already working in that space. Shabana uh, Shakir Ahmad, Ahmed, Ahmad? Ahmed. Ahmed, okay, yeah. <laughs> is the uh, chair of the Tours and Talks program at the Greater Cincinnati Islamic Center. This program has welcomed thousands of visitors to the mosque since its founding in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. Uh, Mrs. Ahmed earned her MBA from Xavier University great place to go. Sarah Weiss is the director of the Jewish Community Relations Council, which has the mission to build bridges between the Jewish and non-Jewish community in Israel. She also serves as the director of the Holocaust and Humanities Education Center. Sarah, welcome back. Uh, Shabana, welcome to, uh, to Newsmakers. Uh, Sarah, let's begin with you. What does America and greater Cincinnati look like through your eyes? right now, not only as a Jew, but also as the grandchild of Holocaust survivors? Well, I think um, America is and always will be a place of pluralism, a place where all of us should and, and, and hopefully will and are do feel safe. Um, at the moment, you know, we've seen rising anti-Semitism um, for the last several years. Anti-Semitism has never gone away. Um, and we've seen it manifest itself definitely um, through the alt-right movement, but we've also seen it grow on the left as well. And so, um, you know, I, I'm most troubled by what we're seeing in schools, what we're hearing about as social norms changing, and want to make sure that we're... For we're, example, what do you mean by that? For example, we're hearing more um, comments being made to students um, in everyday conversations where hate is manifesting itself in ways... You know, we always knew there was anti-Semitism out there. We always knew there were people that hated certain groups of people. but we're hearing more and more of that. And so um, we have been fortunate in America where that's not tolerated, right? When we see, we've seen what happened to the response at HUC and at Withrow, outpouring yeah. of response of, we support you, we stand with you, the, the Know Your Neighbor um, program, people coming out. And that's what we need to ensure continues to happen. Because the minute we um, you know, allow this to become normal, that whether it's a joke or an anti-Semitic, a, a swastika or statement, um, I, I, that worries me. Shimana, same question. How do things look from your perspective right now? Well, today, if you uh, compare to after 9-11, um, I feel that today it's actually, I feel like it's worse. And um, in relating to what Sarah said, and I think it's why it's worse is because our youth are really um, struggling with this, and I feel that they are um, being harassed in schools, um, and we're seeing um, more people. Now, are you talking about you're hearing that 
here locally or is you're just picking up what's in the newspapers, what's happening nationally? I hear, here's the thing with the youth, and I'll tell you this because I have um, three teenagers, they're Americans and they just happen to be Muslims, and I, they keep it to themselves. They hear it in the hallways, they hear it amongst their peers, and sometimes they even hear it from their own teachers. Um, but they, 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 you know, they, they they just digest it. They don't let others know about it only because they're fearful of what it might ba have a further backlash against them. Um, but it is a problem. The only difference I noticed today compared to after 9-11 for the Muslim community is that um, after 9-11 there was a lot of fear. But today I feel like we are getting support. But at the same time it, it's giving um, because of our current administration and what they've been saying, it's giving our youth, it's giving other people in the community uh, kind of a pass to say what they're really thinking and sometimes that can be really dangerous. Um, I, I, I want to mention that for, for the Jewish community and for the acts of anti-Semitism we've seen on a local level, um, you know, we are fortunate that um, for the most part, in addition to the support that our elected officials, our law enforcement agencies, our leaders in the community are not letting it go unchallenged. And that's important. And that's important today, and that's going to continue to be important. And in terms of, you know, ensuring that for our community, right. for every community, because we also know that if Jews are targeted, Every other group is vulnerable as well, and mm -hmm. so we right. need to keep this uh, on the on the radar. The open house event at uh, the center, the yes. Islamic Center at the mosque on Saturday, yes. which I attended, yes, um, was amazing. I mean, the six hundred. I had no idea that the, par the parking was going to be such a problem. <laughs> right, we had Luckily, no idea. I'd been either. there enough that I understood what I should do to get right. to get there on time. Um, it was really overwhelming uh, in many ways but and reassuring yes but it struck me as I sat there that day that this wouldn't have happened without the work you and the other members of your community have been doing right. and the tours and talks, talks programs talks. Mm -hmm. have have been very important that you've laid the groundwork that made it possible for a lot of people to come in. What is it that you've been doing for 15 years? So we have um, at the Tours and Talks um, program that we have at the Islamic Center, I've been involved with that for the last 12 years and the last three years um, I have been the chair. And we are um, continually seeing, um, and we're very happy to see more uh, visitors come to our center. We are offering more programs. We are opening our doors. The Islamic Center has always had an open door policy. And I think that's one of the key things in our community is allowing our neighbors to come in to get to know us as well as uh, for us to get to know them. Um, and so the Tours and Talks um, has been working on a couple of things. They're very new. One of the things that I'm working on right now that I think is very important is um, I call it the ambassadorship program. So on top of, of getting to know your neighbor, uh, which like I said has been very successful, and by the way, March 11th is our next um, Know Your Neighbor event. Okay. Um, we are also, I personally am working on this program called the Ambassadorship Program. So what, what we would like to do is um, in different places of um, in, uh, faith institutions as well as um, businesses, schools, we'd like to have an ambassador in each one of those places kind of representing us um, so that if there, as, if there ever, ever is any crisis or anything that's going on currently like right now, we can have that ambassador speak for us um, instead of us always having to go out there. And so that's something that we're really um, hoping to, you know, make work. Sarah, the Jewish community is embedded in Cincinnati yeah. Yeah. in a way that the Muslim community has right. not, has right. not been. Um, the Jewish community is very old, going back to the early 19th mm -hmm. century, mm -hmm. just right mm -hmm. here at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, so you face a little bit different dynamic. Correct. And you've been reaching out for generations, right. literally. Uh, what do you need to do at this point? How does it, what, what kind of outreach, what kind of proactive work do you do? You know, I think 
we um, continue the, the work of reaching out, of maintaining strong relationships with other faith communities, with other ethnic communities, which is critical to all of us. Um, but to your point, um, the Jewish community has a rich history, in particular in Cincinnati, has been a part of the fabric of our community. You know, just the other day, our city, city council right. made a proclamation standing up against anti-Semitism, and we spoke about the fact that City Hall is right across the street from Plum Street Temple, which right. is probably not the case in any other city. So um, in addition to continuing to, to ensure that that the strong connections uh, exist, I think we need to take a look at our youth and at connecting on a different level than perhaps we have. Um, there are a number of interfaith initiatives as well that are going on that I think we need to continue to strengthen and bolster. And I know Shabana and I are both uh, involved in, in one of those initiatives called Bridges of Faith Trilogue. And yes. um, that's just one of the things happening. And Which I, is where Christians, just, Jews, and, and Muslims, Muslims come together to right. communicate, right. to talk. Right, right. Um, but perhaps we need to go back to some of the basics of, of um, you know, in, inviting people in, even though we right. feel very connected to well, the broader know, community. You mentioned uh, Plum Street Temple, right mm -hmm. there, catty corner from uh, City Hall, right across from uh, St. Peter and Chains, Roman Catholic yeah. Cathedral. Uh, it's one of my favorite places in Cincinnati, and every tour that I do, I take them to that corner, and we get off the bus, and we talk about what's, what the dynamics are in that corner. And I always say to people, have you been in whichever building? Have you been in City Hall? Have you been in? Mm -hmm. And so many people feel they can't go to some place that isn't in their tradition, mm -hmm. whether it is Plum Street right. Temple or whether right. it mm -hmm. is right. um, uh, the mosque, uh, and the idea of just going and even observing prayer in a non-organized, at an unorganized time, right. not during one of the tours, but you know, stopping in, meeting people. The point is, you can do yes, that, right. and but I know, it's so hard yeah, for people to, to take, that, take step. that step. And I know that our synagogues would um, welcome, you know, uh, uh, individuals who are interested in coming and observing a service or participating, similar to um, what we've seen at the Islamic Center. Um, and you know, there's a lot of events going on, also connecting our communities and um, um, educating about uh, the Jewish faith. And you know, we we. We, we invite people where, where we, want, we, want to, we want to reach out. I want to say also, that it is important that both of your two communities, but other, I think of the NAACP, for example, being in the same, there are organizations that need to be actively just standing up That's right, and right. pointing out issues. Right. So in your community, CARE, yes. um, the Council for Islamic Relations. American mm -hmm. Relations, mm -hmm. um, sometimes has to speak in a little bit harsher terms than let's just get together right. and has to sort of stand up for things. Right, that's true. Um, but going back to what Sarah said as well is I really like to focus on the youth and I, I know I keep going back to that. Both of you like that. And, yeah. and the reason why I do that is when Sarah and that's I talked like about this other. earlier, that's right, <laughs> that's why we do like each other, is the reason why I focus on that is because they are our future. And if we can get our youth in all different um, aspects, whether they're in the Latino community or the African American community or the Jewish community or the LGBT commu uh, BTQ community, if we can get all of them together and work on a project, do something together, if they can collaborate, connect with each other at, at a young age, then like I said, they're our future, then they can hopefully you know, be our leaders and focus on the real issues in this country rather than constantly working on the same issues that I feel like the Jewish community is still working on anti-Semitism and yes we are new to this um, we are learning from our I call him I call her my cousin because we are all cousins yeah. um, so that's one of the things I just like to focus on is if we can work with the youth um, yes we're going to constantly have issues care does a wonderful job and we, we support care um, but I really want to focus on getting our youth to uh, to work with one another with the ambassador program Dan you could be our ambassador Sarah can be our ambassador we can work we can be your ambassador um, and work one with one another and hopefully not have these issues for our for our kids and, and I, I in addition I think it's important that while we do reach out and we're committed to interfaith work that we also we do have to stand up for ourselves at, at different times and um, and you know I can say proudly that despite um, recent incidents that the Jewish community is um, is continuing and, right. and it's it's 
it's work, it's faith, it's activities, and um, you know we must continue on, and we must believe that um, we are in a position where we will overcome um, the anti-Semitism that we've seen. I know of a Catholic high school that is working with, yes, with uh, I think Center. with the with Islamic the Center and Center. also with yeah. uh, the Jewish community to bring yeah. high school age right. students together. Right. A really important uh, age, not only because of what they learn and still malleable, but also because they can actually do things together and, right. and, and make a difference in the yes. community. Yeah. And I, I would like to see a lot more of a proliferation of that sort of activity. Right. So, so the next big event for you that's yes. coming up? Uh, March 11th, 1 o'clock. I encourage if you missed out on the last three or four that we had, we'll be doing this um, every single month. So March 11th at 1 o'clock. Please bring your families, bring okay. your neighbors. Very quickly. I would just say that right now the Mayerson Jewish Community Center uh, Jewish and Israeli Film Festival is going on. That's a great opportunity to yeah. um, get exposed to, to some some culture, some uh, through through the lens of film, um, and many other events happening around our community. That okay. And as a final image, I want to use an image that was taken on Saturday of a human chain where people who attended uh, the open house gathered outside and formed a human chain of protections around the entire uh, center. Mm -hmm. And it just somehow symbolically really sounds great. So thank you for being here this thank morning. You. Thank you. And stay tuned. After the break, a preview of the largest annual gathering of leaders of local not-for-profit organizations in the region. Welcome back. 20 years ago, Procter & Gamble loaned one of their top executives, Ed Rigaud, uh, to become the first full-time CEO of the Freedom Center. I had been running the effort out of a contract of my consulting business. About two weeks later, after a meeting, Ed and I were in his office, and he expressed amazement at how much had to be gotten done to make the vision a reality. Then he asked, Dan, when are the 500 people showing up to do all the work? My reply, Ed, they're never coming. You're now in the not-for-profit sector. I have been privileged in my career to straddle the for-profit and not-for-profit worlds. What I have learned is that the folks across the economy work hard, but those in the not-for-profit arena have to juggle a lot of balls uh, and with much slimmer staffs. On February the 23rd, the Leadership Council for Nonprofits is sponsoring a session entitled Nonprofit Juggling People, Perspectives, and Priorities. To talk about this session, I am joined this morning by Jenny Nyerberg, the Executive Director of the Leadership Council uh, of Non for Profit uh, Directors, and Dora Annam, the Chief Operating Officer of the Greater Cincinnati Foundation, which is the presenting sponsor of the conference this year. Welcome to Newsmakers. Thank it's you, good to have you. Um, for a lot of people out there in the not-for-profit worlds, maybe not only employees, but also people on boards, this may sound, Jenny, like a little bit familiar to them, mm -hmm. uh, but it's different. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't just the first time this kind of thing has been done. Right. This conference has been around for 16 years. It came out of a Leadership Cincinnati project. Of course, you are well aware of that. Yes. And, um, and Always, this, never fail to promote. Yes. That's right. <laughs> and, um, and this year, Leadership Council for Nonprofits is, is pleased to sponsor this. And, and we have a great keynote, Vu Le, who is coming to us from Seattle. And uh, he's a little bit more on the edge than some of the speakers that we've had before. But he is... Um, he will do a great job of entertaining us, informing us, uh, challenging us, and really um, and helping us to laugh as well. Tora, do you know Fule? Have you ever? Yes, actually, he's a terrific speaker, and uh, one of the appeals that he brings is that he is going to help us talk more about uh, what it's like to be developing minority leaders and nonprofits, and also which is really building, his passion. It's really mm -hmm. his passion, and also building capacity for organizations that serve minorities uh, in our region. So now, we're really excited to bring him in as a, as a speaker. Now I have to say, as part of the prep here, I went back and found some of his presentations online. He has some pretty hard things to say about funding organizations, like, oh, well, no, Greater Cincinnati <laughs> Foundation, where he talks about all the special rules they have. Are you ready to get poked a little bit? Absolutely. Because I, I think he might do that. I, I, we, we hope he does that, actually, because part of the 
what's really important is for him to come into our region and really challenge us to do better and take things to the next level. So we are currently at the Greater Cincinnati Foundation really thinking about how to improve, become more nimble to serve the nonprofit community. Uh, that's why as a presenting sponsor, we're really excited to support this uh, project because there's really not uh, that many opportunities for nonprofits to come together with so many stakeholders such as board members, mm -hmm. funders, fundraisers, um, and really c come together with a meeting of the minds. Jenny, when you say this is for the not-for-profit, non -pro mm -hmm. I, I tend to use not-for-profit rather than non-profit. Mm -hmm. I um, go to intentionality. Yeah. But in the not-for-profit world, um, what, who are you thinking about? Who, what sorts of organizations do you think ought to be uh, a representative and make sure that they have somebody there at this conference? Well, really, Dan, any nonprofit is is welcome and will learn a lot. Um, not just human services side, but the arts side, environment, education, so many nonprofits. And we really encourage them to encourage their board members to come as well. Just for that reason that Dora mentioned, it's, it's important to see both sides of the issue. And VU does a really nice job of, of not only thinking about uh, perhaps annoying things that funders do to grantees, but what annoying things grantees do to grantors as well. So it's a great opportunity. Don't do that. <laughs> no. being, a, being, a for, being a former uh, uh, grant writer for a university, we never did. Absolutely not. <laughs> you may touch on that. Um, but it's, it's important two, to see both sides. Every story. Yeah, exactly. Two sides. And, two sides every story. and he does a really good job of bringing that to light. So he pokes fun at both sides. So. Um, and how, how many people do you hope you know, what, what sort of you're aiming for and what sort of mix are you aiming for? We're aiming for over 300 people and again, nonprofit staff, executives, board members, funders, fundraisers, consultants, anybody that works in, supports, gives to the nonprofit community is more and than welcome. I think welcome. a part of this too from past experiences I've had with this, um, this conference is that a lot of the learning isn't just from what comes mm -hmm. from the stage. It what right. it's people yes. you meet who you don't work with every day, right. that you make connections. Would you share oh, that? I, I would absolutely agree. The local community is present and really having that opportunity to then take the knowledge from a speaker that's coming from the outside to give us a different perspective and then the opportunity to have a dialogue network and really talk about how that impacts our region is really of great value. So it's really a big uh, part of the, the event. One final sort of thought here. Given where we are at the moment with the new administration, kind of not knowing where things are going, the suggestion that NEH, NEA might be shut down, mm -hmm. what, what do you think the mood is right now in that not-for-profit community? Well, I think it's, it is, um, there's a lot of unknowns, but I think um, so many nonprofits, they're, they're just trying to get their job done every day and they're focusing on that. And I think that's the important part of, you know, making sure that uh, we, we continue to serve the people that have the needs out there. And they're, that's what I see them focusing on. They're juggling on. balls. They're juggling resources. <laughs> they're, they're, they're juggling, juggling balls, balls all the time. And they just don't have time. You gave me this ahead yeah. of time. So. And, and sometimes the ball drops. And, the, and, and, and I think what we're trying to get the nonprofit folks to think about is, what are the what are the balls that you just can't drop? And those are usually the clients that you serve. So that's just we're just playing off that theme. Okay. Yeah. And from a funder's point of view, what is it that not for profits just can't drop? I mean that they have to be good at. The mission, their mission, why they exist, the population that they're serve they're serving, it's really critical that they have all the resources that they need to do that best. And for us as a funder, it's really important for us to build the capacity to, for them to execute on their mission. So what are the barriers they're encountering? What are some of their challenges? And how do we sort of facilitate them to be able to, to reach that is sort of what we're in, in the business of doing. Last week I had uh, Mayor Cranley on and one of his initiatives was the Childhood Poverty uh, collaborative and the whole effort around reducing childhood poverty here in this city. How do you look at that effort in terms of there's been a real effort to bring people together across a lot of lines. How do you look at that as an example of what ought to happen in the not-for-profit community? Well, it is an example of a collaborative effort, and the, and that's part of the reason for this conference is bringing people together. The more we get to know each other, the more we can have those opportunities to collaborate with each other. And this is one great way, and probably the largest way of nonprofit gatherings that we can 
um, just make that connection and really try to make some change, systemic change. Yes. Yeah, in fact, this is probably the largest. It's mm -hmm. largest, and actually, we really believe that it's going to take a different way of thinking to solve the, our problems and the issues that we have that our community is facing and nationally. So this is a great opportunity to really try innovative approaches and have a different conversation to see if we can move the dial. Very good. I want to make sure people know about how to get in touch with this. Yeah. Um, if you work for a not-for-profit or serve on the board of a not-for-profit, uh, sign up now for the half-day conference on February the 23rd. It will be held at the Cintas Center at Xavier University. Uh, register at www.leadershipcouncil.us. Correct. Okay. Thank you for being here this morning. Good luck with the conference. I'll be there. Thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the women and the men working to make our, make our community better in the future. Have a good week. Thank you.